on real estate and commodities. You also may remember last week that it varies, but your typical high net worth investor, he or she has about 80% of their assets in traditional investment, 20% alternative. And you may remember back in the beginning of the semester, we said for Yale, it's the opposite, where they have about 80% alternative, 20% traditional. So the literal definition of private equity is ownership in a private company. So for example, I have an LLC uh, that's a private company for my, some of my non-Rutgers activities. The New York Yankees are private. 99% of companies out there are private equity. When Wall Street talks about private equity, what do you kind of think about, right? They're typically, you know, they refer to a couple of things. So anyone think of anything in particular when you hear the term private equity? Think of very wealthy individual investors. True. Uh, sort of like hedge funds, you do need a lot of money to invest in private equity, not to mention all it gets to the long term lockup. But in terms of the strategies that they do, you know, what, what kind of comes to mind? Private equity investments. Uh, in my mind, it'd be less liquid ones. Mm hmm. So, the, yeah, that you're picking up the extra payment by not having, by by promising not to liquidate or not needing to liquidate for several years. You're correct, Steve. I mean, a lockup's off in seven to ten years. So examples that we'll cover include leverage buyouts, LBO funds, venture capital, angel investing. Uh, you'll see as we unfold. But literally, private equity is ownership in a private company. And there's about 5,000 publicly traded stocks in the U.S., 50,000 in the world. And there's literally several million companies out there, tens of millions if you look globally. So 99% of the companies out there are private and somebody owns them. Most private equity investments share several characteristics, as you know, Steve mentioned, the, the lack of liquidity. If you invest in, let's say, a Blackstone fund, which you know, we'll talk about the players in private equity, the lockup might be 10 years. That's kind of rough for an individual, but it's not hard for Yale Endowment because you have an infinite time horizon. But in an individual, you could have a health issue, you could have a divorce, you could have you know, financial calamity, whatever happens. So locking your money up 10 years is not terribly appealing. Like a hedge fund, they charge the two fees, the asset-based fee and the incentive fee. Most of the investments within the private equity large bucket are on the higher risk spectrum. And certainly the leverage buyout funds, by definition, will use leverage. They're not really used as much in venture capital because those investments are risky as they are. This is an example of past LBOs, and you can see it's a global phenomenon. Dunkin' Donuts, now known as Dunkin' Brands, was actually the subject of two LBOs. By the way, in case you're curious, when a company goes off the exchange and then goes public again, it's kind of called a re-IPO. So Dunkin' was, they were once a small company, then they went on the stock exchange, were there for many years, got taken over, went back on the exchange with an IPO, and then got taken over again. And, uh, you know, you recognize a lot of these names. You can see the global list. These were all once LBOs. And in the case of Duncan, they're back. Domino's is now publicly traded. This is a nice screen shot of some of the different menus in that broad private equity bucket. Anyone know what an angel investor is? I mean, it's sort of what it sounds like, but maybe you can give your own definition. Isn't that an investor gets in at a very early stage and kind of gets the company um, not started, but takes the next step after they get started? That's correct, Steve. So I'll differentiate venture capital from angel investor. 
angel investor is the nice name. The kind of negative or pejorative term is dumb doctor or dumb dentist. And the reason is that most small businesses fail and doctors and dentists are among people that generally, you know, are well paid, have some extra money. I've done some angel investments with very mixed results. Some went to zero. Some I think have done okay on paper. I haven't had a cash out yet, but uh, on paper, I've made some money on some. Why? Let's stick with the nice name, angel investor. Why they call it an angel investor is that they give you money for a piece of your business and they largely leave you alone. They could root you on. They can try to share some connections, but there are very few strings attached other than you can't steal their money and they own a piece of your business. Conversely, venture capital, it's money with strings attached. Absolutely, they're going to be on your board of directors. They might have a say in how much you can pay yourself. There's a fantastic commencement speech by Steve Jobs at Stanford, where, among other things, he talks about getting kicked out of Apple, his own company. And you might say, how could that happen? Well, the venture capitalists and other people control the bulk of the shares. They can kick out management. But it's not all bad. Venture capitalists can call up Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley and push your IPO. They have a lot of know-how. They have experience. They have management talent. So it's not all bad, but it's money with strings attached. Growth capital is an interesting term that's sort of new. Let's say I'm SpaceX. I'm out there. I'm profitable. And let's say I, I just want some money to further grow my business. Growth capital tends to be more mature companies that, as the name indicates, they need money to grow the business further. But distress sometimes happens in the private equity universe. Uh, leverage buyouts are the biggest area of private equity. So there's a whole menu of things. And I'll chat about mezzanine as well. Mezzanine means kind of middle. The biggest in terms of dollars, and you know, if I was doing this graph, I would have picked different colors. But the biggest in terms of dollar investment is LBO funds. And you can see some of these other things. They're ordered in terms of shading. Venture capital gets most of the publicity, but most VC investments are pretty small, unless you're talking about something like ByteDance or TikTok. This is a, a good chart. You know what the term alpha means, right? Alpha means outperformance. And people in private equity, it's sort of ironic because now like Blackstone and KKR are public, they have their own stocks. But they say that you can earn more alpha in private equity than public equity. Because, you know, if I'm buying a company, I can directly influence its strategy. I can do financial engineering, which is piling on leverage on LBO. <clears throat> uh, I can do operational improvement. That means, you know, I might be able to aggregate the purchasing power of my partner companies. Informational advantages, there's no so-called Chinese wall between the publicly traded company and investors. You, you can talk to them because there's no really insider trading. There's no trading of the stock. So this is kind of what they say, that you can earn more alpha, and that's why you should do private equity. This is a nice chart. The, the, the stats are still pretty similar. These are among the largest firms in private equity. I mentioned Blackstone, Carlisle. We chatted about Harvey Schwartz, the Rutgers uh, alumnus, now CEO of the company. The first pure LBO shop was Colbert, Kravis, and Roberts. We got Texas Pacific Group and others. So these are would all be great firms to work for. A very common exit path is from investment banking is moving into private equity. And um, so it's just a nice little screen capture here. Now, you should be aware that if you invest in private equity and you look at your accounting statements, it's going to look like initially you're losing money and then you're making a bunch of money. So we call this the J curve effect. Let me just show the picture. Right? This, this dark blue line looks sort of like a J. And what's happening here is, let's say I raise a hundred million bucks. It's going to take me time to invest that money and then reap the rewards. So notice initially I'm buying all these companies 
and that's why my cash flows are negative. But once I own a company, two things happen. I get the cash flow from that company, and then I could eventually sell those companies or take them public, resulting in other cash flow. And then you can see it becomes substantial over here. So this is true of pretty much all private equity firms, unless you're buying something on the secondary market. But if you're buying it on day one, you know, be prepared to look like you're losing money for the first few years and then making tremendous money, you know, let's say years five through 10. This is an important chart. There is huge dispersion in private equity returns. So let's look at something where there's no dispersion, fixed income. Let's use the most simple case. Let's say you're managing a cash money fund. You're gonna put your money in treasury bills and commercial paper and that's it. The difference between the best and worst performing money market mutual fund might be like 25 basis points. If you're looking at all fixed income, maybe you know, you're spanning a few percent. Conversely, look over here at venture capital. You've got like Kleiner Perkins and Dreesen Horowitz over here that invest in the young Google or Facebook. And then the batting average on most private equity investments is low. I'm seeing that firsthand in the investments that I've made myself. So there's tremendous variation. And this is why, even though somebody might try to replicate the Yale model, you're unlikely to have Yale's type performance because you don't have access to you know, Sequoia, mm -hmm. Kleiner Perkins, Andreessen Horowitz. They're the best funds out there and Yale can get access to them. So just something to keep in mind that there's huge dispersion in private equity while there's little dispersion in fixed income, a little bit more in equity, but not this huge dispersion over here. Now, I don't know if, I don't think Rutgers Stadium has three levels. Uh, I've been in Yankee Stadium and City Field. Yankee Stadium is definitely three, there's three levels. You have the upper deck, which is the top rung. You have the mezzanine section, which is the middle. And then you have the lower levels, which are generally called box seats. Mezzanine is among the lower risk areas of private equity, sort of like an oxymoron. It's still above average risk, but it's on the lower risk spectrum. And typically, mezzanine financing is in a more mature companies. They may be generating some cash flow. So it's typically a bond with some type of option conversion factor that if the company does well, you can participate on the upside. So it's just another private equity investment you'll hear of. I'm going to spend the bulk of our time, not, I'm going to spend a ton of time on, on LBOs. So as the name indicates, leverage buyouts involve purchasing a company where the majority of the purchase price is in debt. Now you might say, how much? Well, you know, Today, you're putting in between 20 and 35% for most deals. During the 1980s, you could put even a lot less. Uh, a little footnote from uni bonds and corporate finance, interest payments on debt are tax deductible. So one of the benefits is as long as you can pay down the debt, uh, LBOs can be extremely profitable because you're basically paying very little in taxes. Okay, so I'll, I'll give our so-called dream scenario for companies that might be the subject of an LBO, but on the surface, you want companies that have steady cash flow because you want to pay down the debt, good competitive position, what Buffett would call a moat, and then low debt before you institute the LBO. Now, there's a lot going on here, but let's you know just take it one step at a time. Let's say I'm going to buy Dunkin' Donuts. Right, so that's the target company. Well, first of all, there's a fund. Now, pretty much everyone in the class, I think, is over 21, so you're potentially able, if you're, you know, if you're not adverse to it, to drinking a bottle of wine, not all in one sitting, hopefully. And if you know anything about wine or different types of spirits, there are certain vintages. Uh, so the vintage, 
you know, 2000, let's say 18 may have been good, while 2020 may have been hit by a drought and the grapes may not have been so good. So private equity funds are always in the market raising money. And so, uh, you know, let's say I have Blackstone LBO fund 2023. I'm guessing the returns of the 2023 fund are going to be better than the 2021 vintage where they bought all these expensive stocks at the peak of the market. So you have a fund, Rutgers Private Equity Fund 2023, Blackstone Fund 2023, and you have the limited partners who put in the money and the general partner, also known as a financial sponsor, that's Blackstone, KKR, Carlisle, where they put in a little bit of money, but they get the 2 and 20 fees for running the fund, as well as doing all the work. So you have this fund, Vintage 2023. And if I'm going to buy Dunkin' Donuts, I'm not going to buy it in all equity. As I mentioned, this equity number is typically 20 to 35%. The safest debt is bank debt that's paid first. And then you have debt in the middle, which is usually high yield bonds. You give that money to Dunkin Donuts, you give it to the old shareholders, and also you get rid of the old debt holders as well. So the way I think of it is that the old capital structure, which is on the right, goes away, and you have a new capital structure, which is on the left. And that's how it works. And then you buy you know, 30 or 40 of these names that are in the fund and the fund exists for 10 years and you gradually liquidate these positions you could always you know sell it to another fund but that's typically how it works so let me just pause there and see if there are any questions about private equity at this moment all right so this is sort of our you know dream scenario of a a good lbo High free cash flow. There are a lot of businesses that generate cash flow, but the free cash flow is not so good. Uh, airplanes and autos are two good examples, right? If I'm Delta, I'm spending new money on Boeing airplanes or Airbus airplanes. I might be opening new gates at airports. If I'm Ford or GM, I have to invest in electric vehicles and other things. While conversely, like Seize Candy or Coca-Cola, those are cash flow machines. They have a lot of free cash flow. Low debt to equity before the LBO, because you're going to put them on. Strong position in a non-volatile industry, so you can pay down the debt. Good management. In most cases, existing management stays on board, but sometimes they kick out management. Another movie, I'd rank it a little bit below founder, is uh, Barbarians at the Gate. That's the movie, I think, came out in the 1990s about the uh, RJR Nabisco LBO. High cash on hand or assets that can be sold quickly. Uh, Blackstone, you may also know, is the largest owner of real estate in the U.S. They bought a bunch of office buildings before the Great Recession and were fortunate enough to sell a bunch of them quickly to de-risk that transaction. Uh, a lot of times they're trying to improve the profit margins. They can do that by their experience, by buying in bulk, by having management expertise, by correcting a mismanaged business. Let's see what Elon's going to do with, you know, uh, uh, Twitter. He said that they're going to be cash flow positive soon, but I don't think you're going to make much money on it. By the way, uh, Elon is going to try to turn Twitter into uh sort of like wechat that i know most of us don't know wechat but wechat is sort of like an everything app there's payments on it it's social media it's this it's that and uh, so that that's been elon's vision elon as you know is one of the founders of paypal so let's see how twitter evolves last but perhaps most importantly you're not really going to buy a company unless you can envision the exit strategy the exit strategy could be an ipo it could also be a strategic sale. So let's say I buy a tech company and I sell that to Cisco. And it could be, you know, the worst case scenario, which is not terrible, is you just sell it to a future vintage fund. Hey, I can do a quick screen. You know, I've shown you Finviz most classes. 
But Finviz also has a screener here that I may have shown you, but I can do a quick LBO type screen. I'll just make it simple. Let's say I'm picking stocks from the S&P 500. These are big companies, obviously. I want to pick companies that are a reasonable valuation because I want to sell them at a higher price. So let's say PE under 15. We mentioned theoretically high profit margins because, you know, you don't want to have a risk of a company having negative profit margins. And then I mentioned low debt to equity, um, you know, because you're going to pile on your own debt to equity. So I'll say less than 0 0.4. So these 18 companies might be decent LBO candidates. I mean, it would cost a lot of money to buy, you know, Conoco Phillips or Cisco, but <clears throat> some of the other ones wouldn't be so bad. Pfizer would cost a lot of money. But some of these other ones, 10, 15 market cap, wouldn't be too bad. So some good things about LBOs is that for the top firms, and we saw that little scatter diagram, the returns at the top end of the spear were like 35%. Um, you know, leverage sort of works. As long as your return is higher than your cost of capital, leverage works. We had that table about different sources of alpha and you don't have to meet Wall Street numbers every quarter. No Sarbanes-Oxley. You could manage more for the long term. Um, top talent can fix margins and companies sometimes. But bad things, high fees, just like hedge funds. Long lockup. The typical hedge fund has a one-year lockup. Some have a little bit longer. But no doubt, you know, the shortest you'll probably find unless it's a secondary fund is uh, five years. I'm not going to worry about the IR calculation, but the, you know, we saw the whole J curve thing. It's a little weird. The returns using leverage is always risky. And sort of when you invest in an LBO fund, you give your money and you have no idea what they're buying until after the fact. So a lot of people don't like the fact that there's no transparency until the deals are done. You have no say in it. It's tax time. Hopefully everyone's getting their taxes done. I'm filing for an extension, but we'll have to, you know, pay whatever I owe. Uh, if you invest in a hedge fund or a private equity fund, you're typically getting a K-1 statement, which, which can be kind of annoying. And then furthermore, the fund themselves might have an extension. You might say, where do the returns come from if I invest in an LPO fund? There have been some studies on this. Roughly a third comes from leverage, which you can sometimes do on your own, right? You can invest on margin just buying stocks, kind of like a do-it-yourself -your LBO. One third of the returns can be from fixing the companies. We'll call that profit margin enhancement. And then one third is that, let's say you're selling the company for you're buying the company for 12 times earnings, selling it for 14 times earnings. So selling at a higher valuation multiple. The typical exit sale, which is preferred, is selling the firm to another company. And the reason is that you can redeem your full investment right away. If you exit via an IPO, typically you're only selling 10 to 20% of the company at the IPO, and then you have to wait years to get fully out. So IPO may give the higher valuation, but when you sell a company to a strategic partner, your investment is fully redeemed on day one. These are among the mega unicorns. A unicorn is an investment, a private firm that's valued at more than a billion dollars. I guess unicorns aren't as rare these days. There's about 800 of them, at least a couple of years ago. These are the ones valued over 10 billion. ByteDance owns TikTok, and they'd be valued close to 500 billion if this was updated today. We've mentioned Elon's company SpaceX. They're probably valued close to 250 billion. 
And this is Stripe, sort of a financial payments firm. And you can see they're all over the world. The, these are more VC type investments or growth capital as opposed to LBOs. But wanted to show you it is global phenomenon. And some of these numbers are much bigger than publicly traded firms that are in the S&P 500. Any questions or comments? All right, we're making our way across the private equity universe and then eventually we'll get to real estate and commodities. Uh, I mentioned that one exit path is doing an IPO. So unless you have a course in investment banking, you may not know how the process works. If you're a firm like SpaceX or ByteDance, everybody is dying to be your banker and take you public. Other times you might have to contact the firm proactively and that's where like a venture capitalist can come into play. Now it varies, but a rough rule of thumb is the bankers are gonna take 7% of the assets they're gonna raise from you. Let's use uh, some round numbers. Let's say you say, I need hundred million to grow my business. The bankers will say, okay, okay, I'll raise that money for you, but I'm gonna take 7 million and you can have 93 million for your corporate treasury. This process usually takes several months, but in terms of work, it's usually a few weeks of intensive work, right? Part of it is you're waiting on the SEC to do documents. And I've never met a poor investment banker because usually the small groups of teams, and let's say they get $7 million for this deal, half of it might go to the parent company and half of it are split among a small team of bankers. Now, if I'm SpaceX or ByteDance, as I said, every investment bank is beating down my door to do the IPO. So there's a so-called beauty contest where each bank pitches to ByteDance or SpaceX why they're ideal to be the lead underwriter. It's a big deal to be the lead underwriter because number one, you get make the most money, but two, they have these league tables that are very important and if you're listed at the top, you're, you're able to rank higher in the league table than at the middle or the bottom. Uh, so I, I worked at Merrill, but I was in more the investment area rather than the banking. But I knew a little bit of their pitch. Part of their pitch is that they had a, a large retail base as well as institutional base, therefore being able to drum up a lot of demand for IPOs, while Goldman had more of an institutional base. In addition, Merrill for many years had a very highly rated research department. So the analysts would often initiate coverage on the stock. So each bank has their own pitch of why they're good and best to do the IPO through them. The documents are created, prospectus, a pitch book. Um, I hope you know, you've been writing down some of these websites that we've been going over throughout the year, not that you need it for the exam like FinViz and Whale Wisdom and uh, Fed Funds Market Watch tool. Another one that I haven't mentioned is retailroadshow.com. I might have time to pull it up. They'll have a, the list, the pitch book of all the IPOs that are in, in the pipeline. And there's not much right now, but it's cool. You get to see what you know, Fidelity is seeing, what BlackRock is seeing. And... Um, you know, there's not much. There's a, not surprisingly, there's a gold mining company doing an IPO. Gold is pretty hot, right? We're still sort of in this bear market. So you usually get the current ones for free. It's sort of expensive to get the historical ones, but it might be fun, you know, if you have access to look at what Facebook was saying during their IPO and Ferrari and, and stuff like that. And some of you want to go into banking, you'll see what bankers are doing in their pitch deck. So that's retailroadshow.com. may want to add it to your emerging bookmark file. Literally, management goes on a roadshow. Now, today the roadshow is probably a mix of Zoom calls and face-to-face. -face. But, you know, if, if I'm Fidelity, management's going to come to see me. If I'm BlackRock, management's going to come to see me. If I'm the Gates family office, Somebody might come to see me. So literally, management will go on the road 
to prospective large investors. After this, the investment banks, and usually there's a syndicate, have an indication of interest. Let's say I'm at BlackRock Growth Fund. I might say, okay, I want 50,000 shares. So you build this book, and then by having an, an idea of this demand, as well as precedent transactions or comps, that allows you to come up with an IPO price. And then it trades on the exchange. And once it trades on the exchange, anybody with money can trade it. But that initial price is determined by prior comps or deals and the indication of interest. Now, it's not a coincidence that every country around the world, there is a substantial jump on the first day. Now, this happens for several reasons. Number one, at least with substantial IPOs, the company, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, they're pretty much guaranteeing that they can sell the deal. So they want to kind of protect themselves and price it reasonably such that they feel like they'll get the demand. Two, everybody knows that prices often jump on the first day, so it's kind of like free money. This one, you know, you might say, what happened to 257 percent? Well, this is China. This was skewed. This was the year that Baidu went public. And you may not remember this, but Baidu jumped like 400 percent on the first day it went public. And, uh, you know, there were only a small amount of IPOs from, from China that year. But let's look over here in the kind of the belly of the graph. The average jump on the first day is 20 percent. That's 20% in one day, not one year. So it's like giving your client potentially free money. Now, the company sort of gets shafted a little bit because they're basically selling a slice of themselves for a lower price. And how they control this is that when they typically do the IPO, they're only selling 10 to maybe 20% of themselves. Um, they can do a secondary offering a year from now, and that would be at the current market price. But not a coincidence that pretty much every country around the world, you're getting a decent jump. Now, in private equity, we're talking about IPOs, we're talking about M&A, we're talking about deals. And there have been, they've been, studied, been various studies on mergers and LBOs and you know, some work well, but most have a negative net present value. And you might say, why do most deals, M&A deals, not, tend not to work, right? And one is, you know, what's a good price to pay, especially in young companies? So here's sort of a comic strip joke that was true. Sun, which is owned by Oracle, bought this company called MySQL. SQL stands for Standard Query Language. It's like a language of databases. And this person says, isn't it free? Yeah, this company had a freemium product. So how do you value a company where they're giving their product away for free? Not easy. These are some historical multiples. If you're buying an industrial company, the premium is typically 25 to 30%. If you're buying tech companies or biotech, the premium could be 40, 50, or 100 uh, percent. I mentioned the term precedent transactions. That retail roadshow uh, website would have a database of prior deals in the sector. Other reasons why deals fail is you often overpay. Uh, I don't know about you, but I bought stuff on eBay and. I once bought a car that needed a new transmission, like an older car. So the winner's curse is that if you won an auction, maybe it's you didn't really, you either got caught up in the euphoria, or you didn't think of the downside. So one reason why deals fail is that the winner often overbid. We call it the winner's curse. A problem that's hard to quantify in a spreadsheet, but very real, is called culture clash. This is sort of the poster child of a deal that didn't work. AOL, which was one of the stars of the internet bubble, bought Time Warner, which was the preeminent media company. Time Magazine, Warner Brothers, Sports Illustrated. And of course, they bought them with inflated stock. And then after the bubble crashed, the stock fell 90%. But the culture wasn't too good here. 
Uh, you all know about Chrysler, right? But you probably think of Chrysler being owned by Fiat, and now they're part of a company called Stellantis. If you go back about 15 years, Daimler slash Mercedes-Benz bought Chrysler. On paper, it was a good fit. Daimler slash Mercedes was more entrenched in Europe and maybe Asia, at high-end cars, of course. Chrysler had Jeep, which was kind of a big profit generator. They had the minivan. But it was a culture problem, and Daimler basically gave the company away uh, to a company called Cerberus, which is a private equity company, and they went bankrupt, and then Fiat bought them out of bankruptcy. Let me just open it up to the group with questions, and maybe, you know, were you the subject of a merger? Was your company the subject of a merger, and was there any cultural issues combining the firms? I've been through a few mergers. Not going to have gone, gone okay. But there's definitely, you know, a culture, the company usually doing the buying, they tend to be in control. So anyone have any merger uh, stories to share, good or bad? All right, hopefully all your deals are friendly and going pretty well. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and speak on that. I mean, I kind of joined right when we were, were merging, the L3 and Harris uh, Harris merger. Mm -hmm. So um, just getting everyone on the same page was, I mean, needless to say, kind of a disaster. Two separate mm -hmm. systems, like uh, yeah, trying to pick which financial system to work. And I joined a little bit late in the game. I joined, I joined like 2021. And we were still doing um, merger stuff after the merger had complete, like for quite some time. Um, still doing stuff, still doing stuff to this day. So um yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's almost like they're something that's never complete, but I mean, I'd say it went yeah. well. Um, I mean, our um, product lines and like our segments kind of grew in multiple areas, so like that went well. But as far mm -hmm. as managing it, it took a really long time. Yeah, thanks for sharing that uh, story, Cameron. Uh, yeah, it's um, a process, and people are obviously worried about layoffs. Uh, Ian? So. I worked for Simon & Schuster, which was the publishing arm for CBS, and um, towards the end of my time there, CBX, CBS actually remerged with Viacom. Um, they were originally one company, separated for around 10 to 15 years, and then came back together. So, But as part of just a branch of CBS, really, we didn't deal with it all that much. Um, we got a couple more perks out of having Viacom back with us, but otherwise it was just bringing back together something that had separated 10, 15 years beforehand. Yeah. Sometimes companies, they split, they come back together. Um, so thanks for the comment there, Ian. Do you prefer Ian or G um, to go by? I don't care one way or another. Here, it's just how the uh, software registered bank. Okay, whatever. Sometimes, sometimes software is uh, weird. It doesn't allow me to put in G as my first name. They require more than one character. Okay, whatever you prefer. Happy to go down that route. So culture is very real, and it's hard to quantify uh, in a spreadsheet. Yeah, I mean, we were lucky enough with us to at least have, like, you know, it the merger being within the defense industry. So there was yeah. a lot of synergies that were kind of easy to recognize. Mm -hmm. It was kind of just a matter of picking the best process for yeah. you know, what we were doing in each area. And like I said, we're still doing that like yeah. uh, to this day. Uh, yeah, plus, yeah, plus Cameron, you, you know, your your main client is the same one, the U.S. government yeah. makes it a little bit easier. Correct, yes. Yeah. So but there's definitely some a lot of synergies there. So, um, but I mean, our stock price jumped, I mean, like, almost 50%, like before we even closed the merger. So, I mean, I think Wall yeah. Street kind of had a, had, a had some hindsight there. <laughs> Good. So I like to give examples, both men and women, when I can, to be equal opportunity here. Another reason why deals tend to have a negative net present value is called adverse selection. Adverse selection means good firms are not going to sell unless you pay an outrageous price and the bad firms are likely to sell. So this is uh, Rowan Atkinson, also known as the comedian Mr. Bean, Brad Pitt, of course. 
Uh, if you remember the 1970s, Farrah Fawcett, and then Joan Rivers, the late comedian that would poke fun at her looks. Let me give you a real example. About five years ago, Microsoft tried to buy Salesforce. Salesforce said, no thanks, I'm doing just fine as I, I am, but if you pay an outrageous price, maybe I'll consider it. And of course, the deal didn't get done. And I'm sure if they bought some other companies, they could have got them. So just be aware that the great companies are probably have no need to sell to you unless you're going to pay a very high price. While the companies with problems, you know, there's AT&T has been a company that's made a lot of poor acquisitions. They bought DirecTV, which they way overpaid for, so they sold. And now DirecTV lost the uh, NFL contract to Google. And obviously they were paid for kind of Time Warner. So that's kind of the problem that at and is buying these companies that have problems. It's sometimes it's called a lemon problem that, you know, you're buying a, a car that has problems while the good cars are not being sold. So we call that adverse selection. All right, we're going to start real estate. We'll still go another 10 minutes or so, then take our final break. Any questions at all on anything tied to private equity or M&A? All right. We now have a real estate major at Rutgers, so you can concentrate in finance and real estate and you know, bait, whatever you want to do. And surprisingly, you know, when I think of real estate, I think of a building, but so real estate is not easy to define, but here's a working definition. It's land and improvements on the land. Those improvements could be the buildings, props, minerals, oil, gold, whatever. It's the largest category of real assets, which will include commodities and other natural resources that I'll get to after the break. Real estate is tangible. It's long-term in nature and historically, not always, but historically acts as an inflation hedge. So it'll have some portfolio diversification properties and you know our course is called Portfolio Theory, so we'll circle back to that. All right, here are some broad categories. Residential real estate. Most of us are probably doing the Zoom call from the confines of your home. Commercial real estate. A lot of things there. Shopping centers, industrial, like Amazon warehouses. Multifamily. Office buildings, hospitality and then land. This is a good chart. Now, I would argue this chart's a little bit out of date, but if there's a question on the final, you know, just think about this chart. Usually, so we have lowest risk to highest risk. Usually office buildings prior to the pandemic was low risk. And the reason is that your contracts are typically like 10 years. You have generally more affluent companies that are signing these contracts. Apartments are usually less risk than residential because the, there's usually a lot of turnover, right? Some people live in an apartment permanently, but usually uh, it could be a starter home. It could be people are relocating somewhere. The cost is typically lower. Therefore, more people can live in an apartment than a large home. You have a strip mall. We talked about having like an anchor tenant, whether it's McDonald's or Target, residential, and then land is the riskiest because there could be zoning issues, there could be environmental issues. Uh, and this is sort of like a cap M line going through here. This is lower risk, lowest return, highest risk, highest return, even though we know the office market is in flux today. And I'll go a few more slides and take a break. Overall, real estate is a good diversifier, but a point I'll make maybe before the break now and a little bit after the break is that you're really not getting tremendous diversification by trading REITs. Uh, I'll expand what REITs are in a few minutes, but the correlation of REITs with like the S&P 500 is like 63%, which is high. Otherwise, you're getting pretty decent correlation, right? These are like the office buildings, then they're inversely correlated with bonds because they typically have an, uh, rent escalators. So bottom line, decent diversification, 
or real estate categories unless you're talking about publicly traded REITs. I mentioned today, if you're doing deals, you're going to have to put down 20 to 35 percent. But during the Great Recession, or at least before the Great Recession, you could put down a sliver of equity. You may have heard of these. I think we talked about these ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets, no problem. So Harry Macklow um, was a billionaire at one point. I think he's still pretty wealthy bought $7 billion of real estate by putting only 50 million down and basically he borrowed 99% of the money. You can't get away with this today, but it happened and these things defaulted and uh, he lost the 50 million, but I think he still resurfaced and still pretty rich. Let me just kind of look ahead because we're going to take a break soon. All right, I'll do these three slides and then get to mortgage-backed securities. So how can you invest in real estate assuming money is no issue? Well, the easiest thing to do is buy a real estate investment trust. A REIT trades just like a stock on the exchange. So for example, we may have talked about Simon Property Group, SPG. Uh, that trades just like Coca-Cola. You wouldn't know the difference unless somebody told you it's a REIT. You can buy real estate companies. Cole Brothers is a real estate company that sells high-end homes. You can buy hotel chains. You can buy you know, other firms that are in the real estate business. I'll get to mortgage-backed securities after the break. You can invest in private real estate funds, fund of funds, just like you can invest in a hedge fund or real estate partnerships. Uh, I've invested in some real estate with one of my former MBA students who's, I think, done a really good job. And these are just, you know, agreements between us and there's a third friend of mine. We buy these homes, he flips them and sells them, and he gets a cut for doing all the work. So, as I said, the easiest way for a retail investor to trade real estate is through a REIT. Part of it is that, you know, real estate itself is quite expensive, right? To buy an apartment, especially in this area, a home, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. But REITs trade just like a stock. And now, like, you can buy fractions of shares. Uh, thanks for the, the question, Suleiman. Um, activist investors have looked at McDonald's, and activists don't really have much of a say McDonald's because the stock is near a 52 week and all time high. But there have been some proposals to split uh, McDonald's into a REIT and then the franchise company hasn't happened. Uh, Sears, their real estate get, did get split off into a company called Seritage. Uh, I don't know if it's done that well, but certainly did better than Sears, the department store. Uh, REITs can be diversified or they can be specialized. I mentioned that Simon Property Group is focused on malls. Uh, there are healthcare REITs, there are mortgage REITs, there are office REITs. The main downside of REITs is that they have volatility like stocks because they trade on the exchange, they have daily liquidity. So you're not getting the diversification that ideally you know, you want, but it's better than nothing. REITs are sort of these specialized securities and in order to, they, they only have one layer of taxation that the, there's no corporate tax, but the individual pays tax. In order to get that tax benefit, the REIT has to pay out 90% or their more of their operating income out as a dividend. So that's the benefit of it. And REITs are a global phenomenon. You can see some of the countries here I'll pull up Simon Property Group. Most REITs pay a high dividend, and that's the bulk of the reason for you know buying them. I'll put an SPG, which I don't have a position now, but I've owned them in the past. If you've been to the Menlo Park Mall, that's one of many of their properties. Sure, 
why it's not pulling up. But uh, yeah, so look at this. Usually when you see a dividend over 5%, unless it's a utility, there's a problem. And, you know, I don't think there's huge risk with the mall REITs. There's more risk with the office REITs. But yeah, this is 6.5% dividend. And you could see, you'd see a dividend like this even before T-bills started to go up. And the reason, as I said, is that REITs by law have to pay out more than 90% of their dividends, uh, their income out as dividends. So most people buy a REIT for the dividend and you're hoping to get a little bit capital gain. So it makes sense to take our break here. I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions you have on REITs. Come back, talk a little about mortgages, then move on to commodities, and uh, obviously talk about the project. Any questions on uh, real estate so far? All right, let's come back at 8.10. We'll finish up and then talk about the projects.